Hello, welcome to Real Gardens. As a gardener, I always feel that summer has three parts. There's early summer, there's late summer when you come back from your holidays, and there's now, midsummer. And it's definitely got its own atmosphere, its own smells, its own jobs, and it's a time of change. This week, Anne-Marie makes her last visit to Stockport and gives Mike a good <laughs> whacking. Ooh, I love it when you do that. I'll be talking about colour schemes with Liz Collinette, and on her final visit to Devon, Carol has at last persuaded Adrian to blitz his buddy. Adrian and Debbie Taylor have worked incredibly hard this year to improve their Devon garden, even though they both have demanding jobs in the police force. It really is quite big, isn't it? But it's when Carol made her first visit back in March, their garden suffered from a lack of planning. The main bed was overstuffed with plants, which Adrian had bought at auction in cheap job lots. Carol suggested a radical redesign that involved repositioning most of the plants. But each of these things is supposed to represent... I found Carol quite intimidating at first. I, I was... Didn't scared. Know, didn't, I was scared? I didn't know I was scared. scared. I was not scared. I'm scared of things like snakes. Despite their initial reservations, Carol's plan has worked brilliantly, and the bed is looking better than ever. Carol's also helped them to clear out the leet at the bottom of the garden and plant its banks with wildflowers. On her last visit, they transformed the patio, complete with its own Chelsea-inspired water feature. It's given us such a huge sense of satisfaction because everything is really coming into its own now. Mm. I just can't wait to show it off. Adrian and Debbie have planned a party for Carol's last visit, but to make the garden presentable, there's one last area to tackle. This is the area that we need to zap up a bit. It's yeah. in the front of the house, and it's right on the entrance, and I really, really think that... I mean, first impressions count to me, yeah. and we've got these people coming, and I want to zap it up a bit. It's this bed, really, and it's not that it's a real mess, it's just a bit of a mishmash, That's isn't right. it? What do you think we can do, cos we haven't got much time, have we? Well, we no, need quick some inspiration, fix. Carol. <laughs> These are big bits of granite we found down the reclamation yard. They look like curbstones. Mm. Yeah, well, they, they might make a brilliant edging for here. Yeah. What do you think? They would look very dramatic. Mm. Well, this, this area here we used as a holding bed for when I bought the stuff from the auctions. I have to tell you, it looks a little bit like that, doesn't it? Especially with the addition of this forest of buddleys here. Aren't they, aren't they great? I don't, no, I don't think they are, really. I think, <laughs> I, I think that, Carol. you know, <laughs> it really is a question of, you know, inappropriate plants, really. Mm. Each of those conifers, if you leave it another couple of years, will, you know, fill a huge space. Mm. And um, they'll all just be fighting each other. So it's one of the hardest things about gardening, I think, making that decision to actually get rid of stuff. Mm. I think we need to take the bull by the horns and just get rid of everything. Right. Start with a clean sheet. You keep keeping Adrian? Mine <laughs> included. <laughs> It'll come in useful for digging out these buddlers, won't he? In true Devon style, the heavens have opened just as we start. But we've got to get on and make some decisions about the fate of these plants. So what about these buddlers, Adrian? I, I'm quite happy to take them out and we can um, maybe think about putting one back. Right. That. With deciduous shrubs, this really isn't a good time to move them. Mm. But I don't think you'll necessarily lose them. If you're prepared to cut them back hard, when well, they moved. I know for a fact I've moved Budley this time of year before and... Um, and you've done it. You can't say that any of... Yeah. Yeah. I haven't done a bad job. I think if you take a big enough root ball, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. The thing is, though, it's hard to take a big root ball because mm. a lot of them have got long, stringy roots. Right. Anyway, come on, put your right. money where your mouth is. Let's go. If Adrian does decide to replant this Budley elsewhere later, he'll have to cut it right back to ensure that all its energy is directed into re-establishing the roots. It's not the perfect time to move conifers either, but their compact, fibrous roots mean they've got a good chance of survival. Yeah. Do you want to repot them or something like that? I, I think definitely want to nice, keep them, yeah. 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 Debbie and I are putting all the plants that we'd like to save to one side. Meanwhile, Adrian's digging up some old memories. This one I'm particularly fond of because I rescued this one from a building site. <laughs> he did too. Is there a Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Budlier? <laughs> Probably. Maybe I should start one. And are you its president? <laughs> <laughs> president, secretary, treasurer, yeah, and only member. As the plant removal goes on, Adrian's techniques are getting less and less subtle. 
With all the plants out, we're left with an empty bed that slopes down to the house. Adrian and I are going to raise it at one end. So while we go off in search of suitable materials, Debbie wraps up the rest of the plants that we're saving. Take, take a couple of those. I shall pick up Can these. you manage two of those? Two? I can manage all five. It's just a case of balance. <laughs> is that what it is? And and we they, know, we know you're not, very well balanced, Adrian. And they are not balanced. Adrian's got some featherboard he's been hoarding that we can use for a retaining wall. It's good. Another bank. The idea is to raise the level of the bed at one end and so even out the slope. Um, back a bit towards me. That's going to be good. The layers are built up gradually with the boards overlapping so that the rain runs off the sides. Wow, that looks really, really good. Very impressed. We've got a hell of a lot to do there, haven't we, before these guests arrive? Yeah. We think that the bed at the front can afford to be narrower than it is. So we're using the soil from there to backfill the new raised bed. This time I'm going to do a quick whiz around the garden and collect a few plants. Adrian's reclaimed curbstone really smartens up the front edge. That looks brilliant! I've got yeah. some instant impact. Right, but it's getting terribly late. I'll tell you what, why don't you two just buzz off and get ready and I'll just finish. Tarting it all up. Go Give on. Me the Come on, Dad, just go and have a shower. With time running out, the long term plans for this border will have to wait. In the meantime, clever use of some of the pot plants will help create the right first impression for the party. Wow! Oh, look at this! That is superb! Look at that! You did it! I mean, Transformed. it's just temporary and it's just for tonight, but it'll do for then, and then imagine well, what. Fun you'll have doing real things. It's really, really good. So right. First impressions count, don't they? Oh, don't they just? Oh, wow. That's... <laughs> well. oh, oh. Hi. Hi. Hi! After all our hard work, it's far too wet to walk round the garden. We'll just have to hope that the guests are overwhelmed by the view from the rain sodden deck. Hi! Hi! Hi. Can Sorry, we yes. I'm no time to change. You'll have to take me like I am, but you used to see me like this. I'll give you a glass of wine. I'm not sure all your wind blown guests think. I think they're impressed. Well, I hope they are anyway. Of course they are. How could they fail to be? Yeah. Liz Colonette's Guernsey garden is now at its peak. Everything from her soft fruit to the cabbages in her kitchen garden is flourishing. But most spectacular of all are the brilliant swathes of colour throughout her beds and borders. Wow, look at those poppies. Those reds are fantastic. Aren't they beautiful? Only last for about a fortnight. I wish I had these in my garden. They're good. And even the field poppies next to the opium poppies are a real vermilion, aren't they? they they're, are. they're not too orangey at all. No, they're glorious. So, do these come back this colour every year the same? Not always this colour, sometimes a deep mauve. And you just let it happen? I just let it happen. I've got a pale pink, cultivated one round here. Come and have a look. What do you think of this one? It doesn't work, does it? I mean, no. it's very beautiful. I mean, look in there. I know, it's, it's stunning. It's sumptuous, it's like velvet. But you can't have these rich, intense colours with pastels which to me belongs to a different part of the garden. I agree with you. Well, you know what Vita Sackville West always did? Mm. She used to cut a flower, walk around the garden with it until it looked right, and then move the plant. Come on, then, let's do it. OK. Well, Good idea it... to cut it at the bottom. Well, that gives us a nice long stem, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. Now, you take this and tell me where okay. you think it ought to go. It looked nice against the delphiniums, but... Oh. They'd all finish at the same time, wouldn't they? That's not going to do. So yeah. that wouldn't work. Well, those are pretty strong. That it'd be yeah. quite nice in amongst these. You see, they that's a sort of pastel depth. association yeah, sort of with the nigella the coming through there and the peter, yeah. the geranium. Yeah, how about this? Well, that's in the wrong place, isn't it? Yeah. Do you fancy a straight swap? Definitely, I do. Because that would work in your hot border. It would. This would work in here. Yeah, and Bob's your uncle. Fortunately, both these plants are oriental poppies, which are perennial and therefore will survive transplanting, unlike annual poppies, which will die if you try and move them. Removing the flowers ensures that all the plant's energy goes into root production. Now, ideally, this job should be done at the end of the season, but by then, it's often hard to remember the exact colour of the flowers. 
Right, water we need. It's like being in an operating theatre, well, this is. <laughs> it's a good analogy because <laughs> everything is going wrong and you're fighting to save it. Mm. So just loads of water in the hole. And then I just leave that to drain and then put the soil back in. And then we'll give it more water. While Lizzie's borders might benefit from a bit more colour coordination, there are some areas that need complete camouflage. Well, Monty, we've still got this ugly area, the ugliest bit of which is this loo. But handy. I've got to have it. Can't do without the loo. Uh, <laughs> so what do you want to do about it? Well, I don't want to paint it, stick out like a sore thumb. Mm. I thought we might just leave it that scrubby colour and grow things over it. And I wondered about having a clematis loo. Clematis and Guernsey go together. On the other side of Vale Pond from Lizzie's garden are the greenhouses which house the National Clematis Collection. The Guernsey Clematis Nursery is the UK's leading horticultural exporter. Five million plants are sold from here every year. And we've come to meet the man in charge, Raymond Everson. Now, you've been told about Lizzie's problem with her loo. Yes. <laughs> needs, needs camouflaging with the clematis. What do you reckon would be suitable? Well, I think the, there are several choices, but I think choose an early spring flowering one. The Montanas always do very well here in Guernsey. And then to choose something perhaps a little bit more newer, a bit more exotic, but also that will have a long flowering period. So I think Montana Elizabeth will look very nice, planted at the back of the loo to, to grow up. And really, it, it can cascade almost over and be, be, be trained in. Now, do you have an example of this? Well, actually, I can show you not, not Elizabeth, but one very similar. Okay. This is Montana Frida. This is a much darker colour. But the great thing about Montana Elizabeth has a lovely vanilla scent. So yeah. that paler colour with a nice sort of foliage yes. will be, I think, a very nice foil for uh, uh, Arctic Queen. Arctic Queen is a stunning double-headed variety. But uh, isn't, isn't that gorgeous? It's beautiful. Though? had an amazing amount of flowers and it's still flowering again. It really will flower from May till September. But what you must remember with both plants, they must be pruned hard the first spring after mm. planting. So pruning them down 18 inches or really 12 inches ab ab above ground level, that will encourage them to become bushy and well furnished at the base. Otherwise you have a stem and then yeah. a bird's nest up at the top. Armed with Raymond's advice and two healthy plants, it's time for both of us to head back to the loo. So, the Montana's going to go round the back. It is. That's going to scramble over the top. Yes. I'll do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Arctic Queen is going in this pot, is it? No, it's going in a bigger one. Right, well, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. And right. how are you going to support it? Well, I thought about the chicken wire netting. I've got plenty of that. The point is, chicken wire, you know it'll be fiddly. You'll, it'll die every year and you'll have to pull off all the bits. Well, I shan't. I should just give it a bang and hope right. they fall off. Okay. <laughs> Liz is using a mortar bit to drill the holes and putting in hooks to hold the chicken wire away from the wall, though horizontal wires would work just as well. Then, with the Arctic Queen transferred to a large pot, we just need a good dose of Liz's rich seaweed compost and plenty of water to finish the job. That's fine. That's fine. Now, if we just tuck that in there... OK. Keep that well watered and that'll be fine. If you have a really hot summer, you might want to put tiles or pebbles on it, something like that. And remember what he said, you've got to prune hard. I'm going to do it. Because otherwise what will happen is, and you see this so often, you'll have lovely flowers up the top by the roof and yeah. a total bare area here. Yeah. And OK. That, you know, it will defeat the purpose. I promise. OK. Well, I'll come back and see. I'm not quite sure. In a few weeks' time. And then you'll be able to see it flowering. Brilliant. After the break, Anne-Marie is helping Mike and Alison complete the transformation of the Stockport Garden. Foxgloves are nearly over, but if you want to plan how they're going to look in the border next year, you've got to do something about it now. Because like all biennials, you sow seed now, they grow leaves and roots, and then they flower next year. So you need to get onto that time scale. And it's all part of controlling the colour in your borders, whether through wallflowers, Canterbury bells. They're all biennials, and they all need to start life now in a seedbed. And a seedbed can be in any patch of ground. All you've got to do is dig it thoroughly, get rid of the weeds, make sure it's sunny but protected, normally in amongst your vegetables. And then just make a little drill, get a pack of the seeds, sow them thinly, and the rows can be very close together. As they grow up, thin them out, and then when you've got a decent plant, transplant them somewhere where they can grow with space, maybe, say, six inches to a foot around each plant. And then when they're really good, healthy plants, without any flowers, of course, transplant them in the end of September is a good time. 
to where you want them to grow, and then that's next year's colour planned and sorted. Now we're off to Stockport for the last time with Anne-Marie, who's got her work cut out to finish off Mike and Alison's new gum. When Mike Woodall and Alison Buckley first bought their house in Stockport, the garden was a neglected and boggy wilderness. Alison and Mike are engaged and plan to move into the house after their marriage next spring. Anne-Marie Powell first came here in March this year and immediately got stuck in with clearing the mess. Since then, she's helped them to overcome the bogginess of the back garden by building a boardwalk through the wettest part at the bottom. They've also created two new raised vegetable beds. The veg bed, um, obviously, it was a must for me in the garden with me being a chef. Um, I've got loads of gorgeous red cabbage and some radishes, and I'll show you a radish because we've had some this week. There. And there's a radish, and there's nothing better than that, that is such a buzz, being able to eat and pick your own vegetables out of your own garden. It's absolutely wonderful. This is our boardwalk, which was suggested by Anne-Marie to overcome the bogginess of the garden at the bottom end. We've had a bit of trouble with the slugs. We decided to eat everything in sight, so we weren't going to put slug pellets down, but I think we're going to have to put some down now. This will be Anne-Marie's final visit, and it's the top part of the garden that still needs some of her magic. Mike and Alison have already made a good start by installing this path. They've got more help in today from their friend Simon. What do you think? I love it. I really like this great sweep leading down to those straight lines there of the boardwalks. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. When did you do it? Uh, it was done yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, a friend of mine's done it. Rob, you'll meet him later. He's coming down. I love that shaley kind of slate. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. Building the path has left the lawn in a bit of a state, and Mike and Alison's friend Rob is going to sort it out. I want to make use of some of the materials left over from the building work we've done. These hazel rods could make a lovely archway, but first I have to persuade Mike. Things are not going to be quite as pliable as they were when we built these, but it would be really nice, wouldn't it, to get some sort of structure here. So you're really walking into this space here, and it's like making an entrance, if you like. So, oh, remember I've got some big sticks here, Mike, so you better watch it. <laughs> I think we should stick them in here and then we'll bend them around. What do you think? I'm not happy. I'm just demonstrating. Yeah, I'm just saying I'm not happy about it starting You're there. never happy when we start off a job. At the end of the day, I think you wanted it to start here, didn't you, Pet? Look at his face. You're not happy, is he? I wanted them all to be, like, next to each other. There's no way, I'm Marie, I'm going to get to my vegetables. Well, I'll tell you what you could do, actually. You could have a bank of, say, six next to each other and then a foot gap. So then you can actually still get through to them. Thinking about it, we can put like your sweet peas, your beans, grow beans up it. Oh, I've always wanted a grapevine, haven't oh, I? Yeah. That's a good idea. Could isn't grow it? a grapevine up it. Well, it might grow on you, just like the grapevine. Why isn't it though? Do you think we should go for it or should we no, start we'll again? Go, no, we'll I think we should it. give it a bash. Well, that's the difficult bit then. Jamming the hazel poles into the veg beds like this easily secures our upright. To help make a graceful arching shape, we're interweaving a few lateral pieces and securing them for the moment with garden twine. Full of bright ideas, they don't always work. No, surely not. <laughs> While we practice our knots, Mike's bunching the poles together at the top. Top on there. Oh, I love it when you do that. Lovely. Oh. Tell you what, for a few leftover hazel branches, that's not bad at all, is it? I think it's good because it really stops this part of the garden here, doesn't it? Yeah. It gives you some vertical height and also you can grow things up at supports. So that's three jobs in one. It's quite sturdy as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. The next challenge for Alison and I is to construct a garden seat. Morning, everyone. Hi, Rob. Hi, mate. Mike's friend Rob has turned up with a truck full of turf and topsoil. So while we get on with the bench, the boys will be patching up parts of the lawn. Right. The design is simple. We're using two logs for each leg and we've sliced the edges off the logs to make them flat and stable. 
Well, swap them over. The I'm going to swap mine around, actually. Oh, yeah, that's OK. It's just faffing about, yeah. isn't it, for a bit? We're good at that, though. Yeah. <laughs> I like to faff. I like the scaffolding faff. planks go on top to make the seat. OK. And then the front one. Finally, two extra logs, one at each end, provide armrests. Well, that's nice, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's gorgeous with that fur. It's lovely. So now we need to join it all together. We're using the drill to countersink the nuts below the surface so that they won't stick out and catch our elbows. Have you seen the size of this? <laughs> it's the longest drill bit I've ever used. Now, I'm a bit nervous. We've hired in an extra long drill bit to fix these steel bolts through all three logs. Then we simply hammer in the bolts. You right? Yep. Watch your fingers. Marvellous. An extra washer and nut on the other end of each bolt secures the whole bench together. Right. Ready? Yep. Oh, lovely. That's fab, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I really impressed. like that. It's really oh, it's good lovely. It's yeah. just the right height. Can fit three people on it. Mm -hmm. And put your beer on it as well. Yeah. And I've also got something else. I'll go and get it for you. Shy girl. <laughs> no, Mike <laughs> bought me this when we got engaged. Really? Yeah, he took me to the Lake District as a surprise. And I loved it. And then he drove all the way back the next day to buy it for oh, me. Oh, wow. So I think she'd look great in there. Yeah, she would look nice. And she, you, she's certainly a contrast to you, because <laughs> you're not a shy girl at all, <laughs> are you? Alison's already planted some shuttlecock ferns. Some people call them ostrich ferns. And these Japanese rosy buckler ferns, which will love the shady north-facing rockery. While she puts the last of them in, I'm helping the boys prepare the old border and the lower part of the lawn for re-turfing. This was the baldest and most uneven part of the old lawn. These pots of colourful annuals are just what we need to brighten up the new bench. While Alison arranges her display, I get down on my knees to finish the lawn. You haven't got any ideas for the bald bits of turf that we're not replacing, have you? Just water it, feed it a bit now and then just mow it at least twice a week. Mowing just does wonders for a lawn, because it just, every time you give grass a haircut, it spreads out some more, bulks out. Finally, everything's coming together. The last bit of slate has arrived for the path. The rockery and the bench look great, and we've reshaped the lawn to match the line of the path. Well, I've been up here a fair few times now to visit you two, and I think we've made a really gorgeous, quirky garden, do you? It is, it's gorgeous, it's lovely. I think a lot of people get a lot of enjoyment out of this garden, won't they? Oh, that's nice. Well, you're going to have to keep the gardening up then, aren't you? Yep. To make sure you do... <coughs> there. Thanks a lot. You haven't got a lawnmower as well, have you? That's it for this week, and next week we're going to be taking three of our real gardeners to the Royal Horticultural Society's Hampton Court flower show. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.